Generally, it's an opportunity for us to talk about the issues of the day. You are invited to join us throughout the conversation. We've got some outstanding guests lined up this morning, Shamin. Good morning. Our first guest waiting on the telephone for us would be Lieutenant Rafiq Shah. And it's a name that resonates with almost mm-hmm. every Trinidadian. We have um, the fortune of having the Minister of National Security here with us, a uh, gentleman who knew you as a youngster, as he said. But <laughs> and he's been saying good things about a youngster you. Youngster by two years. <laughs> by two years. <laughs> yeah. In fact, not even two. I think just uh, one. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. We we get we get some revelations here, but we're looking for context out of 1970. And Charmaine, uh, as you know, uh, laid out a wonderful context there as to where it was. And we want you to come and fill in a number of the blanks for uh, us. Sorry, I didn't hear Charmaine's take on it. But um, uh, where are you now in the program? Well, where we where we are, I, I can pick it up at this point. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to understand, and a lot of our listeners would be, um, uh, I'm sure, clearer after you explain. Kelshall explained at one point that the army was not part of the Black Power Revolution. They had their own issues. And because the Black Power situation was happening on the streets, it sort of collided. They converged together, but the army was not part of that Black Power uprising. Do you concur with that? Well, not the army per se, but soldiers Mm -hmm. within the ranks were very sympathetic. A a fairly large number of soldiers were sympathetic Mm -hmm. towards the black power movement and what was happening on the streets. Mm. So that one can't say that the army per se, certainly not the high command or the, the, the structural army, um, would have been simp- uh, leaning towards the black power. Uh, however, um, a number of the junior officers at the time and uh, many soldiers had uh, radical tendencies coming out of that the 1960s and one has to put it in context mm-hmm. if you were a young person in 19 in the 1960s and you weren't moved by the civil rights movement and the entire issue of race in north america um the vietnam war which was drawing m- massive um demonstrations against it to end the vietnam war and america's involvement in the vietnam war um, and then a rising black consciousness in the Caribbean that spilled over into the Caribbean, not just Trinidad and Tobago. Mm-hmm. We happen to be just the, the, the one that probably went furthest. But um, w- look at, looked at in that context, it was difficult to see, w- or it's, I should put it the other way, it's easy to see how many young men Mm -hmm. in particular, and you had a number of women as well, would be attracted to the movement that was seeking um, black identity. I mean, for all that we had of independence, the question of black identity, you still had uh, OSCs of whiteness, Mm -hmm. if I may term them that way, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the country club, Queen's Park Hotel, Queen's Park Cricket Club, um, you know, workplace uh, everywhere. many such institutions um, where blacks were, perm- were allowed to go, they were not exactly welcome. Indeed, there were many incidents at the country club where um, people, the local whites who were uh, allowed in because of, of their color of skin, very few uh, black people were um, allowed in at all, and where they were, you had instances where they couldn't, for example, go in the pool, pool, the swimming pool. The swimming pool will be polluted. So um, I'm using that to show why and how a fairly significant number of soldiers would have been inclined towards supporting the Black Power Movement, at least what it's for. And that is one of the reasons why I asked you to differentiate because I was um, not as articulate as I could have been in saying elements in the army and not the army. The point I was making was not, uh, I was dealing with Kelshaw's point that it was a result of 
opportunity within the ranks of the army why there was a portion um, that rebelled as against what was specifically happening on the street with the black power movement he sought to differentiate Do, would you agree with that differentiation no i i will say there was a combination not a differentiation mm. because at the same time several things were happening in within the the, the military um first and foremost the so-called contract officers, short service officers who had been retained by the government in 1962 when the army was formed, 62-63, mm -hmm. they were, theirs were meant to be short-term contract, as the term implies. I think it was three years or something so, after which it was expected that they would go back to their substantive jobs they weren't really uh, highly trained soldiers or anything like that, or mm -hmm. officers. They were plucked from their civil service jobs. Um, uh, may, some of them had of, uh, experience as cad officers in the Trinidad and Tobago Cadet Force. Now that uh, does say something, but at the same time, for those of us who were in the cadet service and who went on to get military training as I did in Sandhurst or as Brigadier Alfonso did in Canada, would know there's a vast difference between the training one receives in the cadet corps, as it was then, and uh, at a military training college. Let me bring our listeners into what is happening. The voice that you're hearing is that of Lieutenant Rafiq Shah, who was at the helm of what occurred uh, with the elements of the army in 1970. We also have the pleasure of having the uh, Senator Honorable Minister for National Security uh, here with us. And uh, we are looking at the era of 1970 and on what conditions it applied there. Okay, Brigitte Alfonso, I want to ask you to ask Rafiq any questions that would come to your mind now, because I would love to sit back and listen to a discussion between the both of you. Uh, so I would ask mm. you to ask him a question now. Rafiq Mohammed Shah. Sir. I understand you haven't been well. I, just let me yeah, inquire I'm, about I'm your health. I'm not being too well, but I'm, I'm hanging in there. You probably need to do some um, strenuous physical training. Some uh, prone position that's training. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that's how we started our work day many, many years ago? <laughs> yes. No, uh, I, I continue my daily exercise right. routine. Eh? I do approximately an hour every day, um, but not. Uh, um, I do it on an mm. exercise bike, most of it, and yeah. stretches. and So So, so I'm doing pretty g well, yeah. given all the, the, um, the circumstances. Yeah, I just, I just want to concur with um, some of the observations and statements you, you just made. And clearly, we down in the back room, uh, because I was not yet a commission officer, as you know. Um, so <laughs> that period from 63 to 69. Do you remember Ma Mansa Lord? Of course, I was. Lord Rudolph, Rudolph Joseph in Lord. The, in the back room? He's my bad. She was known as the back room lawyer. Right. Yes. Um, I got into a lot of trouble, but it went well. <laughs> um, but I know exactly what you mean, Raf, when those contract officers, short service commission officers, as they were called, were supposed to hold the fort in the regiment in particular until you guys came back from San Jose. Um, yeah, and, and those senior to us, uh, starting with um, Joe Theodore, who although yep. he came in l l um, late after 62, yeah. came in 65. But that yeah. Joe Theodore, David Dopwell, David Dopwell, Julian, Julian Spencer. Spencer um, um, well, this guy had left already, um, Boxo, Boxo Tony Boxo. But yeah. we, we in the back room were looking up, looking up towards the Sandhurst train officers. Of course, I was supposed to be one, but that's another story. I was sent to Canada instead, mm -hmm. um, used as the guinea pig to go to Yeah, you were the first from the ranks first, to, to First to be trained in Canada. Yeah. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say we were better trained than the Sandhurst train. I wouldn't say that, but... Um, that's a feeling I get from time to time, but uh, we will talk about that over, <laughs> over a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, was two, there were two Sandhursts, eh? Sandhurst, yeah. the military <laughs> college, and Sandhurst, the village. The one that Rex went that to? Some guys probably spend their time in the village. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask, because I'm hearing you all talking of the, poli <laughs> the contract officers, was that a way of, of having like, outside control in some aspects of the army? or no. politicization of, of it at all in any uh, way? I can tell you how we got it in the back room, the junior people. We got, what we got is that these contract officers who would serve for three years would demit office 
when Ruff and Rex and Hogan and a whole bunch of Sandhurst people came back after, they, they used to train for two years actually. What happened as I understand it, um, is that when the youngsters came back, Ruff and others, the persons who had to assess the performances and assess them generally mm -hmm. were these same contract officers who didn't want to go home. Okay. <laughs> they didn't want to go home because the perks were nice. I mean, you had a nice and they looked good in uniform. They good and so on. But they had <laughs> absolutely <laughs> no training other than the cadet training. And I think one, I wouldn't call his name, but one person who went on to become very, very, very senior had all of eight weeks training in England. Uh, yeah. Eight weeks to train a military officer. Is, I mean, you, you, you're laughing. One year at least, possibly two, mm. um, to, to make you into. Uh, a, a junior officer who is about to embark on his profession and uh, is allowed to command 30 to 35 men. But when you have no training at all, you, you, you know, you're not, you're not going in the right direction. And we did not go in the right direction. So but we have a, a, a justifiable grouse, and we have, uh, among uh, among others, Lieutenant Bazi, LaSalle, and Shaw, yes, and uh, they decided to take Vidal, action. Derek. Yeah. There's a lot of grouse, a lot of grouse amongst here. Right. A lot of folks take the action to do something about it. So we get into what climax, what uh, culminated, came into uh, a day when the Army decided, they, the soldiers decided, those who uh, were, you know, not on the, uh, those who, the objectors, as it were, to the conditions as they prevail, decided to move out of Shagaramas. That is the area we want to come into because what happened after that was the uh, the Coast Guard getting instructions to shell an area where the bunker was. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Shah, you decided to hand over the keys to avoid the carnage. Give us a, a feel of what was happening at that time uh, when, the, um, when, when you and your fellow officers were in the hills and the head of the Coast Guard got the instructions to blast but the there hills. There are some flat. misleading things on that as well. And what, yeah. what happened initially was we seize control of Tetra. Mm -hmm. I mean, the initial, um, in the initial attack on, or it wasn't really an attack, it was an initial takeover because it was, it hardly involved any firing. Mm -hmm. um, Rex and I, as the two officers leading this thing, having stationed some other soldiers and officer at the bunker to take hold of the bunker, we thought we had to we couldn't ask men to do something that we ourselves weren't going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing to do was to put the commanding officer, Colonel Johnson, under arrest and then simply take over the regiment and say we're not going into Port of Spain to shoot down any black people um, on behalf of the government. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't quite work out. In fact, it, 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 it had a major slump at the start because... We, we had also decided that we weren't going to shed blood. Now, I mean, that was being naive, and I have no regrets about that at all. Huh? But looking back at it, um, it I was we were very naive to think that you know you could pull off a mutiny or any kind of revolution and not shed blood. <laughs> and I said we we are happy that we didn't eventually. Um, but when when Rex and I could not find Stanley Johnson, he had not come into the camp at all that morning, up to then. Um, the, the next person in line was Major Christopher, and he was never a target per se. But as a token thing, we had to put somebody under arrest in order to take over the camp. And, but he happened to be in the open with, Capt with then Captain Julian Spencer, and we said, well, what the hell do we do? Mm -hmm. He said, well, we, we, we have to go and take, the, take um, <laughs> Christopher, put him under arrest. Um, what about Julian Spencer? Because Julian was one of Sanders. us. He was a professional Sanders train officer. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully Julian wouldn't intervene. Well, that, didn't, that backfired because of that, um, how, how sh the conflict uh, you know, within ourselves as to what to do. And when we went to arrest Christopher and Julian Spencer, both of them lunged, grabbed the rifles, and attempted to pull the rifles from, from our hands. Mm -hmm. At the time, my rifle, I had, I think, two rounds of ammunition in it. One was in the breech, and the safety catch was in the off position, just as a precautionary measure, not intending to shoot him at all. Mm -hmm. But when he pulled the rifle, a struggle took on. The same thing happened with Spencer and Rex LaSalle. And I had to force that because my hand was, my finger was stuck 
in the area of the trigger, and this man was pulling the rifle like crazy towards himself, and he could be shot, I mean, at, literally at point blank range and would be killed instantly. So I forced the rifle upwards, and as it barely crossed his shoulder, a round went off. And then a similar thing happened with LaSalle and, and Julian Spencer. Mm -hmm. uh, Julian Spencer actually got powder burns on his hand, one hand where, that he was holding the muzzle of the rifle. Um, so, and then some other soldiers intervened, not knowing what was happening. I think among them may have been um, a couple of sergeants, Ram Narain, um, uh, I, I can't remember, but there were a couple of sergeants in particular held us from the back rugby tackle style and brought us to the ground. Mm -hmm. well, and then I let go of my weapon because I didn't want anybody to be hurt mm -hmm. at that point. So we, Rex and I were arrested and put into the cells in the opening salvo. But what happened with the men stationed at the bunker mm -hmm. with Bazi in charge when they heard the shot, they said, because we had had no signal pre-planned. This thing was, although we had had, you know, our grouses and our determination not to allow the, reg the government to use the army against the people, we had no solid plans. There are a lot of our listeners who, who, who would have heard you say that. Uh, just to bring our listeners in, uh, Lieutenant uh, Rafi Shah is the voice you're hearing. We have the fortune of having the Honorable Minister of National Security, uh, Brigadier General Carl Alfonso, with us. And we are reviewing uh, what happened because we're coming up on the 45th anniversary of what took place here in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, when you speak of you had no intentions of coming to shoot regular people in Port of Spain, just briefly explain what the instructions that led you to think the government or those in power were asking you to come in against the people in Port of Spain, just that we are clear on that. Well, we, uh, the first orders were given out on the morning when the, the emergency was declared. The state of emergency, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, we were given instructions as to who w was to go do what. Mike Bazzi was assigned the, to Tobago. He had to take a plane and go to Tobago with no troops and no idea as to what would happen what he would do in Tobago. Mm. Rex LaSalle was to report to the Coast Guard to go to Nelson Island where the detainees were being, were, well, they would hold the detainees on that morning. These are the detainees from the, uh, the National Georgia Committee. Uh, time, yes. Who were mm -hmm. arrested overnight in any event. Right, yes. right. Mm -hmm. George Weeks, um, mm -hmm. well, George Weeks and Daga Clive Nunes. would not been in that first slot, but people like Clive Nunes mm -hmm. and Cambon and so on, they were the people already arrested and waiting to go to Nelson Island. Island yeah. um, I was saying that the men at the bunker took the first shot as the signal to attack the bunker. And so they proceeded to... So while Rex and I were being escorted into the, to the guard room, to the cell, where mm -hmm. we would be locked up, I saw, I looked across furtively at the bunker and saw men with their hands up against the wall. I said, good, mm -hmm. bunker take over. And within about five, ten minutes of being inside the cell with Captain Dopwell, Lieutenant Hull, and Lieutenant Mader in, the, uh, in charge of, to look after us in the um, corridor of that the guard room area. The guard room is very small. Um, the soldiers who had taken over the bunker were informed of that we were locked up, and among them, well, Carl will remember most distinctly, Maurice Norrie Powers, <laughs> um, <laughs> a Ferguson guy, and a couple others left there. Under uh, were instructed to go and free us in the guard room, and they opened fire not on the guard room per se, but over the guard room, mm -hmm. and said so they wanted Sean Lasalle out of there now. At which point, David Duffwell ran went up the hill at full speed ahead, and um, Mader and Hull just uh, collapsed. And the soldiers came straight inside, and they freed us from the, the guard room. By the time that happened, hundreds of soldiers, there were about 300 all told at, at Tetron that morning, just came now looking for direction as to what to do. And uh, what are we... Uh, 
at that same point was when the Coast Guard would have been informed that Tetron was an uprising, and uh, the Coast Guard sent the Trinity mm -hmm. to come into the barracks and open fire at the bunker. Well, it wasn't really directly... They weren't, they weren't instructed to fire into the bunker. That would have been a calamity if they had succeeded in sending one shell into that bunker. That whole thing would have exploded with disastrous consequences. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. to fire some shots to um, keep the troops at bay kind of thing. It didn't quite work out that way um, in the sense that I went and got a Carl Gustav and... Ka and Carl will know what the Gustav is. <laughs> He's smiling. And um, <laughs> I got a shell um, and loaded it and was about to take aim at the Trinity, which was just offshore Tetra, when Lieutenant Gordon, who was who, who, one of the early, uh, he died early, yeah. meaning he died somewhere around 1980 or thereabout. But he was Sanders trained too. Sanders. He came, uh, he and Lieutenant, the then Lieutenant Bernard, Cecil Bernard, with who would later become a major. Um, they were looking on at what was happening, and when, he, when they saw me armed with the Gustav, aiming at the, uh, in the direction of the Trinity, came up to me and pleaded not to shoot, that they would get the Coast Guard to stop firing. And that was a timely and critical intervention because had I opened fire on the Trinity, the story would have been quite different. And we are glad, in fact, that it did not go I, there. I am certainly very happy that that did not occur. So, <laughs> um, anyway, and, and the Coast Guard, he swam out to, and spoke with, um, with Commander Williams, Mervyn Williams, and uh, the boat stopped firing. It went, uh, mm -hmm. went off out of um, so. Tetra back to Stobel. We are constrained by time, unfortunately, Lieutenant, uh, but we want to quantum leap into a couple of areas because the Honorable Minister, we have some questions for him as against the Army then and now. What would you say um, was the situation with uh, protecting the citizenry from another recurrence like that? What happened uh, after after that march was the whole situation was w w w uh, came to, to an end after the 70 revolution as it relates to the feeling of many people is that the nation was always in a situation of insecurity if the army is locked into a peninsula and, 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 and there is nothing to stop them should they decide to come out again? Well, strategically, it was always a bad decision to have that army stationed. And remember, in those days, you were talking about one battalion and all the main installations at Tetra. Mm -hmm. I, at what they call um, study groups that the officers had, Repeated recommendations were made to remove the army base from there. I remember um, options that came up. I was a part of a team that came up with an option in the Golden Grove area. Others came up with Longdenville. But strategically, it was a hopeless position to have your entire army locked into a bay with one major route in and out, and that route is exposed on the seafront for about maybe three, four miles. Mm -hmm. So that, and, uh, well, what one can say happened thereafter is although the, the Tetron is still an army base, you have other bases as well. You have Kumoto and Camp Ogden and so on. Mm -hmm. So that um, the danger has been lessened somewhat. But it still is, that is uh, the ideal area for the Coast Guard because they um, operate on, well, on water and on land but it's not the best area for the Army. Uh, before I, I move this discussion to um, Brigadier Alfonso, I want to ask you, because from what your account of it, it was an Army mutiny with one that started with one shot mistakenly fired and would have the powder burns on the, the officer's shoulder been the only casualty of that mutiny? I want to ask, any casualty, any injuries, anything of that? Oh, mutiny? yes, oh, yes. When we, when we, we regrouped and, and then said, well, okay, we're going to Port of Spain, and from there we will head to Camp Ogden, um, consolidate, because there was a company at Camp Ogden, Alpha Company. We will consolidate there and then put our demands to the, to the government. The demands included um, freedom of the detainees, 
that was the, the most political um, the, the demand we were about to make. The termination of the short service contract officers, the removal of the barracks from Tetron Bay to another location, and th there were others that I can't remember mm -hmm. offhand. Now. Um, so th th we then mounted up a convoy with about, I don't know, five, six trucks, about six, eight jeeps, all the soldiers fully armed, ammunition, cargo staffs, anti-tank weapon. Um, we didn't have the 81 millimeter mortar. We didn't see the need to take that. But we took the Gustav, we took the mach general purpose machine guns. Those were two of the heaviest weapons we had in the, um, in the regiment at the time. Mm -hmm. And in a convoy, we started heading out of, of Tetron, only to, to realize that the, the Coast Guard had put some roadblocks to try to, in anticipating that we would do that, they put a bus, a, one, a, one bus across that narrow roadway mm -hmm. and a couple other small obstacles. So the soldiers quickly went, a, a group of soldiers, and released the handbrakes of the bus, pushed it. It was already facing in a direction that could easily be pushed aside, partly over the hill. It, was, it didn't fall down the, the, the almost cliff-type um, terrain you had there, but it was awkwardly balancing. The Coast Guard then opened fire in that area. The Trinity mm -hmm. had taken to sea again under M C Commander Mervyn Williams, and the gunner was uh, then Lieutenant Curtis Roach, and Richard Kelshall was on, on board that vessel as well. Mm -hmm. And they pounded the hillside. The first couple of rounds happened to land in the area where the bus had just been removed. Because they went far offshore, so they were seeing the bus removed, and they opened fire. When one of the early shells, before the men could take cover, mm -hmm. um, hit uh, and exploded in an area near to where some soldiers were, and Private Clyde Bailey, who was in the band, was closest to it, and it, the shrapnel penetrated the, sh the helmet, mm -hmm. and he was severely wounded into the head. But about three other, four other soldiers got minor shrapnel injury to the bottom, the legs, and so on. Um, from the time we had that report that Bailey was hit and a couple others were injured, we called for the ambulance because we had an ambulance in the convoy. And uh, Private Hercules, who was a medical orderly, went with that. Um, the driver was Mickey Haynes, loaded up the, um, the injured soldiers, and sped off with siren wailing to the Port of Spain General Hospital. Bailey had died before they got there. Lieutenant Shaw, um, we are unfortunately, as I said, uh, constrained by time. I just want to ask you this final question in thanking you. Do you have any regrets? And if this situation presented itself, I know it's always difficult to look back at a Sunday's game on Monday morning, but if the situation presented itself again, would you have done anything differently? Would you do anything differently? Maybe uh, I would have been a little smarter. <laughs> 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 Probably no, less yeah, emotional. Yes, I, I guess, um, mm -hmm. you know, we were 24 years old at yes. the time. Eh? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to factor mm -hmm. in that is a youthful, exuberant, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, undertaking risks without even thinking about them and so on. Dialogue is not an option. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, but um, for the country's sake, um, I hope it doesn't ever happen again, mm -hmm. and uh, that, um, you know, w we, when we took that decision not to return fire on the Coast Guard in the sense that we'd have to blow up the Coast Guard boat, mm -hmm. boat the base and everything, and people, more than 100 people would die, we said, no, we can't do that. A so very so good decision. Soldiers were itching, hands on trigger saying, sir, sir, give me the order to fire. Remember, then Corporal Antoine, Carl will know who I'm talking about. He died a couple of years ago. My begging to, uh, with the Gustav in his hand. No, he had a GPMG. The Gustav I was going to fire. Not to, and then they got it. So that, no, um, we, I have no regrets about what we did then, and I was prepared as I wrote today to pay the price for what we did, which was, um, you know, 
sound punishment in prison. There are many who hold you as an example, uh, as an example of one dedicated to the citizenry, and thank you for your contribution. Let me take the time this morning of thanking you for taking the time to be with us, spending such extended time with us, and put in context to something that is of not detailed. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. My pleasure. <laughs>